Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Craig Snyder, the President of the Royal Affairs Council. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you, especially those of you who are new to the Council, uh, for this first 2014 edition of our Millennial Membership Program Series. Um, I give a lot of these introductions, I've never felt so much authority as is conveyed by this particular <laughs> location, but um, uh, we'll, we'll do with a mundane business first. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if I could ask everybody to take a moment, if you haven't already done it, please silence your cell phones. Um, however, we do encourage you to tweet uh, after the program uh, and to like the council uh, on Facebook. Uh, we are building uh, our social media presence um, and we want to keep that going in the new year, of course. Um, I would like to offer the Council's thanks to CFI, the Null Source, for being our gracious host this evening. In particular, I'd like to thank Seth DeForest, Principal of Corporate Facilities here at CFI, the Null Source. And I'd like to thank Campus Philly as well for their assistance in spreading the word about this event. Let me also take a moment to express uh, my thanks to uh, longtime World First Council member and group member Jack Warnock, who's in the front row, president, uh, and partner, I'm sorry, and vice president of Safe Hatch LLC, uh, and uh, all the work that he did on outreach uh, to our speaker, who's very uh, like on the council's behalf. Uh, this new millennial membership series that we have uh, has been named for AJ Raju. Uh, who supported the program uh, from uh, the Reed Smith Law Firm. Uh, AJ is absolutely one of the most entrepreneurial uh, and enlightened civic leaders uh, in the Philadelphia community today. Uh, and as uh, the news hit the press on Friday, it's been announced that he has now assumed a uh, position as uh, chief executive and co-chairman of the distinguished Philadelphia law firm, Dil uh, Dilworth Paxson, LLP. As you know, uh, the World Affairs Council program series, uh, uh, of which you are attending uh, tonight, uh, is aimed uh, at postgraduate students and professionals between the ages of 23 and 40, uh, although, as I like to say at these things, we are not excluding other council members and we're not checking anybody's birth certificate at the door. Um, the program series is designed to feature topics, speakers, uh, and venues uh, that we hope uh, will uh, be particularly attractive to young working professionals uh, and to offer some of the best and brightest intellectuals and innovators making headlines today. And I think you'll see uh, very shortly that we have one of them with us tonight. Uh, it is a fact highlighted in the media too frequently, I think. Uh, that working age Americans under 40 are overrepresented in the ranks of the un underemployed. But it's also a fact that folks under 40 are even more overrepresented in the ranks of the countries and indeed the world's most disruptive and innovative uh, thinkers and leaders. Uh, obviously, we intend to encourage uh, the latter of those facts and not the former. Um, financial success course, is only one of the many measures of impact which people in their 20s and 30s are having on every aspect of human endeavor. And tonight we'll hear from someone who is uh, encouraging and promoting and facilitating the success uh, of many millennials. Uh, Chris Freilich, a partner at First Round Capital with extensive technology industry experience, is going to discuss with us new frontiers uh, in finance and business development. First Round Capital is an innovator in the digital economy, a venture capital firm that describes itself as reimagining venture capital from the ground up to help founders win. First Round created the Dorm Room Fund, an initiative which provides micro loans to technology startup companies as small as an individual undergrad with a great idea in a dorm room. Please join me uh, in welcoming Chris Frank. I'm Chris Fralick. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. This is my my first World Affairs Council event, and I've been I've known of the organization for 30 years, and was pleased to uh, 
to uh, receive the invitation, and I'm really glad to be here. And it, uh, I've got prepared maybe half an hour, I'll keep myself to that, of uh, a presentation that will tell you a little bit about the first round and some specific things of what we're trying to do to uh, add value to our companies in new and unique ways. And also what we're doing with the Dorm Room Fund, which I think is very relevant for millennials. And uh, I would encourage you, my Twitter handle is there, Chris Freilich. Uh, unfortunately, we're not smart enough to be Twitter investors, but I am one of the first hundred Twitter users and use that a lot, so any, any feedback that you've got, uh, I would love to see, uh, to see there and have it engaged there. I'm also Chris at firstround.com if, uh, if you wanted to send an email. So let's kick it off. Uh, a quick little overview about me. I've uh, worked in the tech industry now for over just about 30 years. And the last 16 or 17 have been directly related to the internet. A few companies you may have heard of, it's some you may use, uh, things like Half.com, they were acquired by eBay, Delicious was acquired by Yahoo. A few failures that you, I didn't put them all that put up here, but they're an important part of it, um, where we painfully lost all of our investors' money, it wasted a lot of time, but that's part of the whole cycle of, of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, I think. Um, have mostly lived in Philadelphia most of my whole life, Grew up in Pittsburgh, but came to Villanova, and later got my MBA at St. Joe's. And I've been doing first round for uh, the last eight years. And but I started off my career selling computers. Anybody know the the 30th anniversary that happened this this week? Who wants to say it? The Mac. The Mac. So in 1984, I was a senior at Villanova, about to get my first job selling computers. I. Uh, Sold them for 10 years, Macs and PCs, and I've collected them ever since. So I'll share something uh, from my, my, this is my collection. This is my home office of, of personal computers that go back. If you look in the lower left, you'll see that's a Mac 128 and a 512 next to it and a Lisa next to that and an Apple III below that. So my wife thought I was crazy for a long time, but now, now there's others like me. Uh, so that's, that's where, I, where I work when I'm at home. So today, I, I've, I've thought about it as three goals. So one of them is give you an overview of first round and some of the broader trends in, in venture capital. Another is to get a little bit deep into the dorm room fund and what we're particularly doing to help spur and encourage entrepreneurship literally in the dorm room, which I think is pretty exciting. And third is I hope that you as millennials or you who know millennials would think about startup life as more of a career alternative and a path. Where it, it kind of startles me that, that friends of the family who are graduating from Penn State or whatnot are about to take very traditional jobs and have very limited searches underway. And when I see them, I almost literally or figuratively grab them by the lapel and say, look at this exciting world you could be a part of. And, and, uh, and so I hope that might rub off a little bit here tonight. And so I'll start off giving you just a little background about First Round Capital. Had anybody really known much about us before tonight? Or is it fairly few of you? Uh, I'll give you a big overview. Uh, our mission is to build the best community of entrepreneurs and to build the best venture product to help them win. And you'll hopefully understand what that is uh, as we go through the, the deck. We've built ourselves up as a modern venture capital firm in the staid 50 plus year old world of venture capital that has not changed very much since it got started. Uh, there's absolutely been as much change in the last 10 years as there have been in the first 40 to 50. And we are very focused at the seed stage, the earliest stage of company development. Generally, there are no revenues. There may be one or two founders. There's not even a line of code written for product in many cases. And we're investing about a half a million dollars, which generally gets them, along with other funds they raise, maybe 12 to 18 months of runway to figure out if they've got a product and a market that fit together. And we've done this now over 250 times since we started. Uh, and there are currently over 200 companies in the first round community. 
We do it nationwide, which is also pretty unique. Uh, our Philadelphia office is right at 4040 Locust. We have an office in New York where I primarily work out of, and we also have a big office in San Francisco. And again, we've been national since our inception, which is also kind of a unique invention. And I don't do it alone. Uh, we've got a, a, a fairly large team. Um, there's over, uh, th there's more than seven of us in our investment team. Uh, CC on the lower right focuses on the dorm room fund. Everyone else is in, involved in primary investments and working with our companies at first round. And then we've got an entire platform team. And these folks help our companies that we invest in do better, faster, generally win is, is the goal and it's it's unusual to have as many or more people on that team as we do on the investment side and we're generally trying to amplify our community through a platform that we've built which is a combination of products services and events that we put together for our companies and just to give you a little sense of where you know relatively small Philadelphia started first round fits into the world. This is just one snapshot from last, uh, came out last week, but Dow Jones Venture Source looked at the most active U.S. venture firms in Q4 of 2013, and first round capital was number two on that list. And generally, we've been in top 10 lists of most active, most investments um, for several years now. So that's one indication. And here's another that is slightly dated, it's 2012, but, and we didn't update it yet for 2013, but this is a year in first round capital. And what you can see is um, that along the bottom line with each month is how many investments we made each month. So you can see in January we made one, February two, March three, April four, nothing in May, five in June, and all in, um, we made, I think that was probably, we probably made 37 investments, 15 of which were stealth companies. We weren't allowed to say anything about them yet. But it gives you a sense of the pace. We're basically making anywhere from um, you know, 30 to 35 new investments per year. And the other thing that's listed there, probably too small to see, is that we, we, we saw over 2,700 companies that year. So we're still investing at a fast pace, but a very small percentage. It's still down to the one to two percent of companies that we see we end up investing in. And then you see way across the bottom, you can see there are four exits. That's how we make our money. We invest money into startups. We generally get an equity uh, percentage of the company, percentage of the equity in the company. And when they have an IPO, as Bizarre Voice did, or they get acquired, as a uh, single platform did, we get a return on our on our equity and we pay money back to our investors. So that's a high level overview. This gives you a sense of some of the companies that we've got in our community. As I mentioned, there's over 200. They range across everything from consumer to business to business, to business um, e-commerce, advertising, gaming. Um, these are some that you may have um, had a chance to interact with, but it gives you a sense of what some of the companies are. Um, one, Warby Parker, is anybody wearing Warby Parker or know, know who they are? Uh, they were started right here in Philadelphia uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the uh, four founders. They ended up moving to New York, but uh, it's a good story. Uh, one of the things, so we're known for our community. Another thing that we're known for is our content. And I'll finish up by giving you a little bit of story and invite you all to, to be able to participate in um, in, in some of the content that we create, we're now starting to share, namely the first round review. And then, you know, another thing that we're known for is we have fun and we can poke fun at ourselves. And we put out a holiday video. Uh, I won't, I did want to show you it tonight, but if you go back to firstround.com, you can look up a video that we put out every year. This one happened to my partner Howard, uh, imitating Miley Cyrus on a wrecking ball. <laughs> It's almost as bad as it sounds, but you have to see it. It's not completely bad. And we have all of our companies uh, that participate, or many of them that do, and it's kind of a fun thing. This, this year, it got over 700,000 views. So quite, it got picked up, and 
it's a fun thing people start to look forward to. So let me take into the next section of the dorm room fun itself. And this was an idea that we had um, really only a year and a half ago. And it was that there is an underserved segment of the startup community, which is students. And we look about, you can think about some students like these. The, uh, the, the, the bottom right hand student is Josh Koppelman, my partner, who co-founded First Round Capital. And he was in his dorm room starting a Philadelphia company called Infonautics that went public back in the um, you know, early days of the internet. Uh, that's Bill Gates, who started Microsoft in their dorm room at Harvard. And that's Mark Zuckerberg, who also started his company, Facebook, at Harvard. And did anybody see the social network movie? If you did, you know it's not an exaggeration that for the, the want of dollars to buy servers, he gave up a massive, you know, basically, Eduardo Severin is a billionaire because he wrote a check to cover the cost of the first servers for, for Facebook. And so what it really just draws home is there's, there's a disconnect, there's a need for capital and support at that stage in the dorm room. And that's what we built the dorm room fund to do. We, we created a fund and we made it by students and we made it for students. So we've essentially gone in and, and helped we don't run it, we don't make investment decisions, but we help build a team that's an investment team in a city like Philadelphia. And we give them the capital so that they can make investments on their own. On average, we're making fifteen or $20,000 investments, and um, we've now built it up into a national network that I'll tell you a little bit about. I mentioned it started in Philadelphia, we announced it, um, and we, we held an information session like this, and over two nights, 700 students showed up. It was big demand to be VCs, basically. They wanted to be on the investment team of the dorm room fund. Uh, we, we later got 200 actual applications. I'll show you one of those, it's kind of interesting. And we chose 11 people to be in the initial investment team, and then they started investing, and they invested in eight of the 200 companies that applied. And in a very short order, we took it from one city that took us three months to launch when we were getting going, and we, we really realized we had something here, and if we didn't expand it on our own, other people would knock it off in other cities. And so we then launched in New York, it took us a month, and then we took it to San Francisco and Boston, where we really knew what we were doing and had some momentum going, and it took us two weeks each to get those cities launched. Today we're in four cities, we've made over 25 investments, about a half million of our dollars have been de deployed, and we get to connect with thousands of amazing students across some of the best schools in the country, which is really the point. And th this slide is fascinating, it shows ranked by number of graduates who have received venture funding over the past three years from, um, you know, it just ranks them by school, and you can see, you know, starting at Stanford, and, and going down, uh, in the four cities we're in, we are affiliated with and working with students in the top six already. So we're, we're, we're pleased that we're in the right cities and working with the right uh, universities. And again, you know, here in Philadelphia, we work with University of Pennsylvania and Drexel as the core investment team uh, uh, members come from, but then we can invest in any school throughout the Philadelphia region. And as I mentioned, there are some amazing students. So we had 700 people interested, 200 applied. This is my favorite application. It came from Stephanie. And Stephanie found a way to put in virtually many or <coughs> most of the first round portfolio companies in her application, which along the way mentions, you know, how she, um, you know, wh which, Internships she had, and how she won Penn apps. This and you know, it, it's not just show. There's real, there's real substance there, but it really stood out and showed some effort and uh, was a good example. And Steph became one of our early investment team members. And then here's Dan. Dan's another one of my favorite guys. Dan works often out of our office in Philadelphia, and he just graduated. He's 22 years old, 
and his company that he co-founded has over 5,000 customers. They finished the year with over you know, hundreds of thousands in revenue. On the side, he's a blogger with a half a million followers. Just, just amazing um, students that have long careers ahead of them. And we hope that our investment in them and our getting to know them now is the first of many times we'll be able to work with them in their, in their careers. Um, instead of advisors, we, we created RAs, resident assistants, and we have some world-class folks from the founders of Birchbox, Warby Parker, and Foursquare, and others that are part of the program and they give and, uh, and get a lot out of it. And we've had a lot of press and buzz. My partner Josh, uh, my partner Finn, who leads it from our partnership perspective, have been on national TV shows and it's just gotten an inordinate amount of press. When it first launched, one of my fellow VCs called up and said, that thing is amazing. Is it true that you only spent half a million dollars on it? Like, it seems like, you know, a lot more than that from all the press. And then what I love is that we're, we're changing lives and trajectories of the students that are involved in it. And if you look at Anjane, is one of our early investment team members who just, as he writes us in an email, that you know, he's decided to go and join Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, which uh, is you know, one of the most famous venture firms up and down Sand Hill Road, and he hopes to work with us as he begins his career there. And then Stephanie, uh, who wrote the, the, uh, the interesting application, uh, she was about to go for her Goldman Sachs interview. Most of these kids go to consulting firms or investment banks. It's like their default path. She was literally about to go out the door to interview there, and my partner stopped her, had a conversation about where she was heading. She kind of reconsidered what she was up to. Uh, she ended up interning at a venture fund, and she just is joining Bain Venture Partners full time. So th this is this might be my favorite slide of the whole deck. Of the first 12 graduates through our dorm room fund investment program, zero percent, nobody has gone into. Uh, investment banking or into consulting and you know so we're doing our part to make the world a little bit better <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so that gives you a little sense of dormer from when we can answer questions after or downstairs uh, about that and I'll, I'll do the, the second half of talking about first round and what we do what we try and do differently so if you boil down what a VC does you basically do two things pick companies and invest in them, and you help companies, and hopefully you help them win, help them have an exit, help them, help them return capital to their investors. We're not gonna talk about the picking part, which is, by the way, the most important part. That's the, the vast, vast, um, biggest part of our returns are which companies we get into. But we also think it's very important to help them win, and, and this is the product that we've built to help our uh, companies do better and to win. And we do it with this team that I mentioned is larger than our investment team. So we make significant investment, millions of dollars a year into, um, into this team. And it was formed around a basic idea. So back in 2005 when the firm was getting started, this was the traditional way that VCs interacted with companies. We would be on the board of directors, meet once every four or six weeks, they would have questions, we would do our best to get answers through our network, asking other partners, learning what we met, you know, known from other companies, and trying to get back to them as quickly and as timely as we could. And we realized that probably isn't the most effect efficient, effective way. There's probably a way where you can connect the companies directly with each other. And that's what we set off to build it. Back then, we did it with a very sophisticated tool called Yahoo Groups, which is basically a glorified you know, mailing list. But when you have all of the CEOs of your, you know, some very smart companies, it can be a pretty powerful tool. And the, and the first time we really got a sense of that was um, back in late uh, 2007, uh, when a young Aaron Patzer, who just started a company called Mint.com. Anybody use Mint? Uh, it's now part of Adobe. Uh, they 
launched at the first TechCrunch Disrupt conference, and they won, like, best of show. TechCrunch 40 was what it was called. And they won $50,000, but they also got more customers than they imagined overnight. And in a panic, that night, Aaron wrote this exact email, essentially saying, can you forward this to anyone you know? Our MySQL database is blowing up. I got 20,000 users, 100,000 visitors, and it's crashing. Help. And someone else in our portfolio saw this, happened to know Mark Mikos, who ran MySQL, and gave his phone number out. They called him in Europe. The short of the story was, within about four business hours, they had him on the phone with the person who had scaled Facebook the week prior. And, and they fixed it. And we realized, not only like, we might have been able to get that answer, but it would have taken too long. And we just really recognized the power of connecting them together. And you know, everything that we do now is some variation of that and how we can put the companies together through a whole series of products, services, and events that we've built. And first of all, we put it into software. We write software. We have developers on staff, and we write code, and we build an entire network that connects the companies together. Um, and at one level, it's kind of like a Quora, if you've ever used that product. It's a question and answer service. And so the, the CEOs can ask either by name or anonymously questions. Some of them are easy, some are hard, some are technical, some are, uh, I might have to fire one of my co-founders. An interesting one the other week was, I don't like some of my employees, is that a problem? Do I have to like everyone in the company? And there was this amazing back and forth of you know, feedback for a first time founder that hasn't really thought through uh, that kind of thing. And so that's, that's one piece in the core of the tool. Another is we do extensive salary surveys so that across our hundreds of our companies, thousands of positions, we can do anonymized um, salary surveys to say this is what an iOS engineer gets in San Francisco in a Series A company if they're a non-founder. And you can slice and dice and, and understand what a good offer is and say it with conviction that this is a top quartile offer based on all the data that we have from first round all other companies. So that's another example of what's in the tool. We built our own private label Yelp, which is a service provider directory. If you want to know who's the best PR firm in Philadelphia or the best lawyer in New York, you can get a lot of strong opinions across hundreds of other data points of your fellow uh, entrepreneurs. We put our talent and people that want to come work for our company. So if anybody here is interested in working for some of our great startups, this is where you one place where you might end up is being showcased to all of our companies and they can one click to get introduced to you. And we're doing events, like an, an event like this tonight, we're doing something like this about 70 plus times a year. In fact, this is what 2013 looked like for us. There's, there's a major event to a minor event, but something happening literally every week. And um, a good example of a big event like that is called our CEO Summit. So once a year we get all of our CEOs together, over 200. We'll have world-class speakers. I think in this example we've got you know, Fortune editors, chairman founder of Intuit, the CMO of General Electric, uh, um, Dave Goldberg uh, is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar survey monkey. His wife is Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook. Max started PayPal. So like these are high-powered folks that, that stay and engage in, you know, you know, in a confidential, closed form where they can really share great information. Um, there's some of the presentations, we do a lot of back and forth conversations. Then we, we ended up at the dinner at night and we'll have 30 to 40 VCs in a room, along with all the attendees, there's over $10 billion worth of venture capital in that room, and we've had over a dozen companies funded uh, through that very method. We spend a lot of effort connecting our companies to their ecosystem and important partners for them. So 
you know, in the last year we've made over 400 business development introductions. Like last week I was in San Francisco and was meeting with Apple to help tee up introductions for our companies and opportunities there. We spent a half a day with the chief marketing officer of eBay and we brought in six of our companies to do presentations that were relevant to eBay. So we're doing a lot of those kind of connections. We tee everything that we learn into a common system so you can say, who do we know at Apple, at Microsoft, at Yahoo, and what they're interested in. And it takes us to some interesting places. This last year, uh, we did a business development day at the White House. So I was able to take six or seven of our companies and we uh, were with the, uh, the chief of the Office of Technology and this advisor to the president, and that was, that was a different day. Um, and then talent, you know, beyond raising money, helping your companies find people is really probably the most important thing that a startup has to do. We built a whole practice that tees up talent and sends it into companies and matches people up with our companies. And we've, uh, over time, placed um, dozens and dozens of, of, of great employees at companies, and they can be really transformational. Like if you can help a small company find its first two lead engineers, that could really change the trajectory, and that's what we aim to do. And then the last thing I'll talk about is something we launched recently that I would invite you to try, um, and it's the first round review, and this is getting into the content business. And the backstory is that traditionally all this great information and sessions and events, we've kind of kept to ourselves or we've kept it in the first round community. And you could think of it as it's kind of like the TED conference, which I've happened to, I've gone to TED for 20 years and for most of those years it was this cool little enclave in, um, in Monterey where about a thousand people went to and then when you left there was nothing, you know, no one else knew about it. But about eight years ago, when I was involved with TED, they decided to open it up and create TED Talks. How many people have watched a TED Talk here? So I would imagine you're, you're, you're the target audience if you're here tonight. And those have now been viewed billions of times. And what opening up the content hasn't diminished the value of the conference. It's harder to get into, it costs more now but yet they give away a lot of it. And we thought, how could that apply to first round on some of our content? What if we started sharing it publicly? So we started to develop long form content and take some of the great talks and with the permission of the presenter, turn it into stories with actionable insight, like what can an entrepreneur learn? In this case, how did Etsy grow the number of female engineers by 500%? We wrote this out and it got very well received. It, it was viewed tens of thousands of times. It was tweeted out thousands of times. And we knew we really had something when other magazines started rewriting it um, and basically taking the same story, changing the headline, Fast Company did it, Atlantic did it, and we like, we think we have something here. And we decided to, to really invest in that. We hired an editor. Uh, are putting out stories about every other day. We've got like a, a, some long form content and we, it gives back to the community, it shares knowledge, but it also helps with our brand and our traffic and, and inbound interest to first round. And here's a real example that uh, we, we already had one of the most visited websites to begin with and since first round review, we've, we've seen a 10x increase in traffic to firstround.com um, in large part because of the first round review. So if you go to firstround.com slash review, you can subscribe yourself and every couple days you'll get uh, some great free content. And so that kind of wraps up most of my prepared, prepared uh, part of tonight. And you know, again, our, our, our mission is to build the best community of entrepreneurs, to deliver the best, best product to help them win. If you come to any of our offices, you'll see uh, this sign, we don't call it a portfolio of companies in a silo, we really think of it as a community with a capital C. And uh, if you didn't see our video, this won't mean anything, but thank you. Uh, that's a screenshot from the video, if you've seen it. But it's great to be here and look forward to your questions.
before turning to the audience, let me ask you to just do a couple minutes, if you could, on the other half of, of, the, of the process here, which is picking companies. So we've got uh, undoubtedly people in the audience here who you know, have ideas, may think that they have the next big thing, may have the next big thing. Your funding is at 1 to 2% of uh, potential of applicants, so to speak. So what, what, gets, what gets somebody over that, that funding line? So we, we break it down into a few big buckets, and one of them, and, and by far the, the most important in our mind is the team. Who are the people that are behind this? What have they done before? It doesn't mean have you made a billion dollar company before, but have you ever done a startup before? If you're going after, you know, trying to build an app, have you ever built an app or, you know, like that kind of, you know, what, what does the team bring to the table? Um, the product itself, which really would relate to what is the idea, is important, interesting, but probably the least important in our mind. Yeah, particularly because we see that as the most likely to change as a company gets into market. And so we, we you know, we, we probably look at that with the least amount of uh, weight on it. The other thing that we look at for a big you know, a big indication of is the market. How big is the market that you're going after? The addressable market? Is it growing? What's your plan to go after it? And we kind of weigh those three things. But an important part too is how do you get introduced to us? Like if it, you know, that uh, trusted sources of introductions are very important to VCs. They, there's, there's too much noise and inbound for a good VC. They need filters and people they trust to um, you know, to help make the right connection. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm curious what your take is on some of these companies like Snapchat and Instagram with just enormous valuations, but no revenue, and whether or not you think that's going to be a long-term trend and just your overall upside. So, I, I think there, there are different points of view on when and how important it is for companies to have revenue. And I would say I'm probably somewhere in the middle of the pack of people you might talk to. There are some firms and companies that would, would say all that matters is users. And in the case of Instagram and Snapchat, I think those companies have created tremendous amounts of value. And you know that they will be able to monetize them. And, and I think they both have made the right choice to not worry about it yet. Um, you know, how much was uh, Instagram was bought for how much? A billion dollars? And Snapchat reportedly turned down $3 billion offer from, from Facebook and neither had a, a, a nickel of revenue. But what they have is users that are massively engaged. For, you know, there's an argument or a theory going around that younger kids aren't really getting on Facebook anymore. They are absolutely on Snapchat, they're absolutely on Instagram, and that's too important for Facebook or anybody else to ignore. I think there's other examples where, of companies that might have waited a little bit too long, and, it, and, it, and they have to work a little harder to get to, get to uh, you know, to maintain evaluation, and, uh, and basically, if you, it's, it'll still cost money to run these companies, and so, if, if investors are not willing to put more in, then, then it forces the issue of when, when revenues make the most sense. But, but there's certain companies, like the two that you mentioned, where it's you know, how big does the market get, how engaged are the users, is the most important question. That's, that's, that's more important than what the revenues are right now. Please. Yeah, so at a very high level, so you, you know, you would start with individual angel investors that could be friends and family or someone that's made some money and they, you know, might give you relatively small checks uh, to help you get started. We, we started as a professional seed fund kind of sitting in between 
angels and early stage venture capital. Um, and you know, in in our world, you know, we you know you, you've got initial check sizes that average you know a few hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand. That's kind of the, the the range that we that we work in. A term you hear sometimes is super angel. Uh, and we're a little unique, focusing just on the earliest stage and kind of being in between those two worlds. Then you get into more traditional, what they would call Series A investors and, and later stage investors all the way up through, you know, private equity kind of, uh, kind of shops. And as you go up, the amount of money managed at each stage gets, you know, higher and higher into, you know, the biggest funds are multi-billion dollar funds that could put, you know, 50 or 100 million dollars to work in a company. And generally there, you've got big traction and big revenues and you're, you're funding growth. Versus at our stage, we're still very much funding, you know, two guys in a PowerPoint deck or an idea or something that needs to be built and proved. But we work very closely with, it, 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 it's a symbiotic relationship to some degree, it's competitive in other in other ways, but we 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 rely on later stage investors to come in and fund our companies. Like in the, on the chart that was up there before, in 2012, we might have invested, I, I'm guessing, 10 million dollars in initial funding into um, into our companies, but all of our companies raised over $900 million from other investors. So that leverage in later stage investors is a very important part of the ecosystem. Does that answer? Does that answer? Other questions? Can you talk a little bit more about your background and um, what brought you from selling computers to the VC world? And what I'm interested in more is your mindset. And was there anything that really attracted you that, that, that took you over that road? Yeah, so I, I got a little, I was a little bit primed for it, but I was a little bit lucky as well to get into the tech world and to find out something I really loved. And what my mom tells the story, like I had sort of, I think I've had 18 jobs in my career, so I, I was probably like on the fifth one at some point, and my mom was a little upset, and, and she's like, what, what's going on? And I'm like, I'm not worried, I work for the industry. I just happened to work for this company at this point in time, and I just knew that the tech industry was, you know, where I could always work and what I loved, and and I got into that, and then started getting more into software than hardware and services, and I started the, like the interesting companies that I liked were backed by VCs. They had venture capital money, and I back, and it's interesting because today. Every VC blogs, every word they think, and there's so much information out there. It's quite, quite amazing. Back then, there was hardly anything. Like, there, were, there were two magazines. One was called Red Herring, and one was called Upside, and, like in the early, mid-90s. And, and it, you know, that, the, the data in there was six months old, and it was, but it was all the best that you had. So you would devour these things, and I got to meet some, uh, some of the VCs that were backing these companies and I met with one in Philadelphia here and I wanted to be a VC so I started talking to him and he uh, he ended up saying go to work for one of my companies and that was one of the companies that blew up and where we you know went out of business and you learn what I learned was I didn't even know what to ask I didn't realize they didn't have any money in the bank when I joined them that would have been a good question to ask and how they were being being funded um, but it ended up then being in some venture back companies that did well, and we did well with the process of raising money and being acquired, and I got to understand that process and knew that at some point I'd like to do that, and I had met Josh Koppelman through Half.com, and he was an investor in Delicious, and he and my partner Howard had started up first round, and the timing was right, I'd just been acquired, uh, Delicious was just acquired by Yahoo, and I wasn't going to stay at Yahoo, and I was looking for what to do, and they had been growing and needed some help, and the timing was right. But it was, it was it's not an easy field to break into, but it, it's one like, that like, I often give advice is, if you want to be in venture capital, um, 
you know, one good way is to get perfect 800s on your SATs and go to the best schools and, you know, start as an associate and work your way up, and, and, there, and people do that. But another good way is go to work at a startup and get to, get to know the investors as well, you know, and get known in the industry and build a track record from that perspective, and that's where a lot of, you know, a lot of funds, and many, of, many folks who have had successful careers at Facebook or Twitter or Google are, you know, now go off and start little micro seed angel, you know, uh, super angel funds on their own. And so that's a big trend that's happening too. Thank you. Please. Hi, so aside from the dormant fund, what's the range of investments uh, first on makes into early stage companies, like outside of yeah, so as I mentioned, Dorman's about $20,000 per investment. In our, our investments average about $500,000 as an initial investment. And that's been consistent since we started way back in 2005. On the low end, you know, it's probably never been less than $100,000 in a few examples. In, in a few rare examples, it's been over a million, but on average, it's been pretty consistent there. Yeah, so generally it's it's the it's the company's responsibility. And generally it falls on the CEO, although sometimes they might have a CFO or COO or someone who helps them. And in some cases we are helping them as well. Um, in, in, in most cases it's a joint effort. And I'll give you know one of our companies is um, you know a few that are raising right now, but one one in particular you know, it's, it's right now they, they sent out a note and with the board of directors, and again, it's so important to have the right board and advisors and lawyers and people that can help you navigate. And so they have, they basically came up with, this is their wish list, right? Here's who we think we want to meet. Here's the names of the people. And you know, here's where we need introductions. So everybody went in and said, I know that person I can introduce you to, I know this person. Oh, by the way, do you realize that these 20 VCs are going to be at our dinner at our CEO summit in two weeks? You should put them on your list and tell them we'll be in, in San Francisco in two weeks. And so it's a collaborative, it's a collaborative effort. But my one big piece of advice is to make sure that you're, you're doing work at understanding what the investor is interested in.